Well, good morning, IBC. We're back here in holiness class, and we're going to start this next session on, on hair. And uh, we're going to deal with uh, what the Bible says about the difference between a man and a woman. What's fascinating to me is there's a lot of people, a lot of confusion in the culture right now, the apostolic culture, and because not a lot of teaching has been done on this uh, like it was in the past. I remember my mother, when she was first in church, uh, she had just never heard this. Uh, she had had the Holy Ghost maybe uh, two weeks and was getting ready for church and just got the baptism of the Holy Ghost just a couple weeks old in the Lord. And, uh, she, she and my aunt were getting ready and she had trimmed my aunt's hair and was getting her ready for church, you know, making sure they're all looking nice. And she took decisions and started to trim her hair. She said she felt this little check and something said, you know, should you do that? Now, of course, she knows it was the Lord. It was the Holy Ghost, God's Spirit inside of her checking her and and she said, well, you know what, let's just, I'll wait and I'll do mine later and, and we'll we'll go to church and we'll get an early seat because everybody wanted to get there early. We had a packed house and the church that I grew up in. And and then when they got in church, there was a guest preacher that came in. And what did that preacher get up and preach on that night? He just handled it. He said, and you ladies, you need to understand that the difference between male and female is men are not to have long hair. And, and women are to have uncut hair. And this laid it out, and it was a beautiful affirmation to her. Of course, she knows now, all these years later, that it was the Holy Ghost speaking to her and guiding her in this particular issue. And and so there's a, a lot of uh, wonderful things that we could talk about like that. But there's also some confusing issues, like why, why is hair such a big deal? And we've already done this a, l a little bit, but let me go ahead and, and do it again. Uh, I'll illustrate it this way. My wife uh, had... When we were first married, a few years into our marriage, uh, she was at school one day and, and she started like down, split down her body. One side of her body started going numb. She started seeing a lightning bolt like across her vision and one eye and tingling sensation. I mean, right, like, right down the middle, even like in the middle of her tongue. One side she could feel, the other side she couldn't. Uh, she started slurring her words and we thought she was having a stroke. And it was, uh, of course... Uh, very uh, concerning to us, and we took her to the doctor, and and come to find out, uh, she has something called complicated migraines, which is complicated, I guess, and it and it masks as uh, the symptoms of a stroke. And what the doctor says is like it's something like this: you have the you have the small end of an issue, then you have the large end of an issue, and so this would be like a a stroke. But the small end of an issue might be something more like a complicated migraine. And your body handles those issues differently. And, and the same is true with like things in the, in, uh, in the Bible. There's some wonderful ways to understand that. I, I think the Bible also says something like this. Like on this side of the issue, you get the separation of, uh, of the sexes in dress. We also have like... The issue that we're going to talk about today, uh, the issue of, of hair. And, and you know, you have all these other issues. Uh, you have the issue of uh, effeminacy and blurring the sexes in terms of a, a young man that's uh, acting in an effeminate way. Or if we could say turn that around a, a, another way way to deal with that is the same type of prescription as applies to a woman. She's acting in a terribly uh, masculine way. And, and then on the on the far side of that, as you progress in some of those issues, you hit things like this, homosexuality or, or transgenderism or all those other terrible issues that are in our society. <clears throat> now, I'll just say it this way. Uh, when you when you understand that these are the issues that are at play, you realize that God has put in His Word and in His directive a barrier to protect us from some of those issues. Now, here's the here's the thing: you have to understand that that when you get some of these other issues, when people start uh, uh, forsaking the boundaries around some of these things, like the separation of the sexes in dress or issues of effeminacy or hair, and they start blending the sexes. Um, I'm sure uh, you, we could talk about it, but, you know, candidly, that usually tra uh, transfers right into some of these other lifestyles. And, 
you know, that people that start out, you know, watching the wrong entertainment, acting effeminate, effeminacy, messing with the boundaries of God's prescriptions around these separation of the sexes and dress. And then all of a sudden we wonder how uh, people get into some of these other issues. But that's what this is about. It's a, a protection for those types of things. So um, I, I'm going to quote again one of our wonderful Chin pastors who said, you know, Brother Kilman, uh, no one has ever taught us this. And he said, I told the I told the group of chin pastors that I meet with, wonderful chin pastors in Indiana, uh, about 40, some of them. He said, if we don't get this separation of the sexes and dress nailed down, uh, we're going to be overcome by the homosexual agenda. And that was a tremendous insight for that wonderful pastor. He was here taking some classes, pastor about, uh, you know, uh, about 250, 300 people. Tremendous, tremendous insight on these issues. So take that seriously. So... Because we, we got to understand that God has given us these prescriptions to protect us from the chaos that's in the culture. And, and that becomes, when we become disobedient in that area, it's not long before in our culture we have given up all the boundaries. And now we don't even know what bathrooms to walk into uh, today. All right, so uh, I, that's kind of the precursor. That's the cultural issue. Unfortunately, there are even some apostolics that think, well, man, this is just not clear. And they've, they've unfortunately listened to the wrong people and there's some and and again much like feminism has made some massive emissions and so sociology and psychology is catching up and many people are embracing the holiness ideals that they have left many denominations massive admissions today that what we've stood for for many years is right uh, in the same way on those a aspects of holiness and dress you you have kind of a real cultural revolution and admissions in current scholarship that what we have been saying about 1 Corinthians 11 is right. And I'm going to give you as many of those sources as I can. And this is going to be detailed. And the reason I want to give you the details is so that you can be able to, to defend this position uh, from people who uh, candidly are not caught up to speed with admissions in their own denominations. And then also because, unfortunately, some apostolics are saying things like this. Uh, we cannot know what is on or not on a man or woman's head. They think the language of 1 Corinthians is somehow unclear. And, and candidly, uh, I, I don't uh, think this is mean-spirited at all, but I think that there are some people that have gone to seminaries and institutions of higher learning, and, and they've, they just take sometimes what a professor says there is the gospel. When you actually look at the data, and I'm going to show you some current scholarship, not because like one scholar add weights to the Bible, but to show you that that scholar's arguments are absolutely true and vindicates the biblical position. And that it's not, uh, it's not ambiguous at all. That it's universal uh, how the terms for uh, cut and uncut hair has worked in history. And you're going to see that we're right. And that there's a, and, and again, I'll just say this, I'll be candid. If there was a, if there was a reason to give this up, I would give it up. Uh, if it was not clearly something that was a biblical position, why in the world would you add something that is not required? But to, the flip side of that is this. If it is the biblical position, why in the world wouldn't we teach it? Okay, And, and I know that's the way you feel as well. So let me just say some things uh, uh, as well. Uh, there are some people that will say, uh, this, is, this is nothing more, Brother Kilman, than an old cultural argument. Um, and, and you just have to say, uh, by the time you get done with this Bible study, uh, this walk through 1 Corinthians 11 in detail, you're going to go, that person just doesn't know the Bible. They haven't listened to Paul. And, and I want to point out those things to we, uh, you as we go along. So let's just kind of dive in. and We'll start with uh, 1 Corinthians, and, and we're just going to walk through the text. It'll probably take us two lessons to get all this done, and then we'll move on to other things. But I want to give you the big piece of this because of uh, kind of some liberal arguments in the culture. And, and then some liberal arguments inside the apostolic movement. And we want to make sure that we have a good answer from the Word of God to dispel these uh, false ideas. All right, the Apostle Paul says, Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. And, and, and again, uh, all of those things that it protects us from is important, right? And so that's why Paul says, follow, follow me. Why? Uh, because uh, when people say, well, these, these verses don't matter, that means they're not reading the Bible because Paul's going to say, follow me. You ready? Make sure that you're doing what I'm doing. And, it, and he says, you need to follow me. 
You need to follow in these issues. And when people say it doesn't matter, I have to choose between you and Paul, right? And you can tell them, you see my dilemma, right? I'm apostolic. I follow the apostles, not you. I have to follow this apostolic doctrine. And, and the Greek word is mimetai, and it means to be an imitator, a follower, or one who mimics. And Paul's saying, uh, you need to imitate me, my example. Follow me, uh, be ye followers of me, even as I uh, also am of Christ. And, and so it's fascinating that Paul's saying something like this. If you love God, you'll imitate, candidly, those that love God. If, if you're ready, if you love the world, you're going to follow the world. If you love Corinth, you're going to follow Corinth. But Paul says, since you say you're Christian, if you love God, imitate me. All right, and and the big problem there at Corinth is they're they're uh, they're imitating the Corinthian culture. They are not following Paul's pattern. They're following the culture. Just like there will be some people that will come into your church and they will be so steeped in the culture that you're going to have to teach them how to be male and female. The world's trying to tell them what male and female is. You got to inform them from the biblical perspective what God wants for male and female too. Okay. And, and we're going to talk about it. So we're going to talk. He's dealing with the teaching concerning worship. He starts in chapter 11, verse 2, and he goes through 1440. He's going to talk about what happens when you're worshiping together. So 1 Corinthians 11 particularly is about the teaching concerning cut, uh, uncut hair and cut hair. That's what it's about. And, 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 and notice this in the text. Women feel picked on, but he's women are addressed. But you ready? He's also addressing men. So it's not just the way uh, God want a wants Amy to wear her hair. Back when I had hair, it's the way God wants me to wear my hair. And even today, you know, uh, you got those poor guys that are bald like me, and they and they grow down the hair on the sides, and it's like, why do you do that, bro? Just cut it all off. What are you doing? All right. And so uh, I don't have to worry about that so much anymore. But again, it's it's God's order for both. And the question is, are we going to live the way God wants? Or are we going to follow the world or, you ready, our, our own uh, desires? And by the way, those desires are informed by something, the world. Will, are you ready? The question is for me, will I be the man that God wants me to be? Will, and will Amy be the woman that God wants her to be? Right? And that's the real question at the end of the day. So, so why do we believe men are, and women are to be marked different uh, by their hair? It's very simple. Is it just cultural? If it was just cultural, I hope you would give it up. You ready? Or is it based on Scripture? And if it's based on Scripture, then we want to do what God wants us to do. So Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18 and 19 is one of my favorite scriptures in the in the whole of the Bible. It says this, but the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto that perfect day. And and, and that means uh, the old timers would say it this way, the more I walk with the Lord, the more I know and the more I appreciate and the more I fall in love with the Lord. The more I walk this holy way, the more I appreciate this holy way. And I'll just say it this way, the more uh, the more I've lived and the longer I've lived and the more I've seen the consequence of sin in the culture and the consequence of sin in the lives of people I'm teaching Bible studies to and helping disciple at the church. And uh, you ready? The more I understand that God's ways are right. And, and so you ready? The, the Proverbs verse 4 verse 19 goes on to say, but the way of the wicked is as darkness and they know not at what they stumble. And the Hebrew is very strong. You could translate it. It is deep darkness. They're stumbling around in life. They don't know how to operate in culture. Uh, and and you're, they're trying to have a good family. They're try, and, and they're just bumping into stuff. They don't know that they have an enemy. They don't know that there's, uh, ways, there's ways to find blessing. And because they don't have the light of the truth, they, they can't walk in the, uh, the power of that truth. And so then God sends us. To, to shine the light into darkness. And, and here's the tragedy. Some, uh, the path of the just, we got the shining light and they're walking in darkness and sometimes we're afraid 
to shine that light and to tell people how to walk appropriately before God. And there they are stumbling around in darkness, wishing somebody could tell me, why is my marriage wrong? Why am, why am I having so many issues around sexuality? And, and why, why are these things cut loose now in my family? And you can tell them how to walk in obedience. Okay? <clears throat> I'll just say it this way. Proverbs 31 was read in the home, every home of Israel every Friday night before Sabbath. So on Fridays, as part of worship, they would read Proverbs 31 every Friday night before Saturday Sabbath. Now that means Proverbs 31 is about the quintessential godly, virtuous woman. So in every home of Israel, on every Friday night, they were, they were lifting up the biblical example of what a godly woman looked like. Now, I'm going to be a little pointed here. What's being lifted up in our homes right now every Friday night? Well, I'm, I'm a little suspicious to say as Americans, you know, we know what's being lifted up on Friday night. It's, it's these abysmal kind of things in the culture, these things that tear down a woman from being godly and holy and sanctified and separate from the world and, and, and instead promoting these other terrible things. So it's no wonder we're having issues in our culture. And I'll go further and say sometimes in our own apostolic homes, in our own Christian homes, the ideals that are being lifted up are not the godly principles. We're not talking about 1 Corinthians 11 or Proverbs 31 or 1 Timothy 2 or all the other verses that we looked at. And instead, we're allowing other things to inform and giving away those teachable moments to the culture like we've already talked about uh, this semester, so I won't re rehearse it here. But one thing I say, every, when I go teach uh, youth camps, and I've had a lot of fun doing that, been privileged to do that. I love our fellowship, and I, I, I love to say it. One MTV producer said this, we don't market to this generation. Now catch this. He says, we own this generation. And I love telling young people that quote. Because I want them to get a little fire in their belly and to understand that there's some young people that say, you don't own me. This world doesn't own me. No, you don't own me. I understand you're trying to market some image to me, but some young people, and you got to walk out IBC and teach them to say, if the world is going to say we own you, you got to say, you don't own me. I belong to God, and I can show other young people how to walk in, in power and understanding and victory and refuse to be manipulated and to walk in the power of understanding and to go shine the light into this dark world so that other young people can see that light and and say uh, we're going to uh, we're going to follow God too and come out of darkness. And and the last thing I'll say there are three big questions. I know, forgive me, it's kind of behind the uh, little thing today, but there are three big questions that young people are asking: Who am I? Where do I belong? And does does my life have any significance whatsoever? And psychologists will tell you that's the three big questions that young people are asking. And by the world, the world by the way, the world is trying to answer those questions every day. Who am I? And they they're saying, well, you're this and you're that. Yeah, you know, this is what male looks like. This is what female looks like or or this is transgendered or Z or all this other nonsense. You ready? And 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 uh you know, this is what value system you should have. This is you should value money. You should value popularity. You should value sensuality. This is your value system. They're, they're trying to tell them who they are all the time. And, and you ready? Not only who they are, but where do they belong? You be, Well, you belong in this category. You belong in this. And, and don't belong to the church. Belong to this instead. And, and, and you ready? And how does your life have significance? And they're trying to give answers through, through feminism or, or through change, trans, you can have fulfillment by coming out of the closet or becoming brave and being transgendered on college campuses. Or are you ready? The lies of materialism. Your life only has significance because you got the most toys or, or you join this big social revolution of global warming or, or you're pro-choice and you become the big liberal ideas person. And so the world is trying to answer those all the time. And you got to answer those to your generation. Who am I? Well, I, well I'm, a, I'm an apostolic. I know who I am in God. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cultural changer. I'm a, I'm a world changer. You ready? And where do I belong? I belong to the apostolic church. And I, I belong to God in my relationship with him. And, and does my life have significance? Absolutely. I'm the only place of light and victory and power in the world. 
I'm what God is doing in the earth. We are his hands. We are his voice. And my life is filled with incredible significance. And if the world is going to try to answer those questions, you need to answer those questions. And part of that is saying you're apostolic. And we do believe in the separation of the sexes. And that's not a punishment. That's a powerful protection and a powerful way to pull people out of darkness so that they can live in victory as the men and women that God wants them to be. That's how important uh, these uh, particular aspects are. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a detailed look at the text. Why? Because, first of all, it's the Word of God. And then, secondly, we, we need to understand that uh, Corinth was a, a pagan Greek city. And you ready? Uh, they, they had immoral women that were uh, even sometimes priestesses coming out of the context of, of, of certain types of, of worship. And they would leave like the temple cut of the cult of Diana and, and, and where lots of horrible practices were being gone. And, and you ready? And, and they would say, like in First Timothy uh, chapter 2, you can see this, as well as First Corinthians, where they're coming out of this priestess worship. And, and there's so much bad ideas in the culture where they're saying uh, a woman is this and a man is this. And, and it's the same thing you're dealing with. There's so many bad anti-biblical uh, ideas in the culture that you're going to have to tell them what being a man is and being a woman is. And, and you ready? And, and Timothy, uh, Paul had to tell Timothy that uh, a man should pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting because they didn't even have, and where they, he was ministering, they didn't even have a high priest. They had a high priestess. And they were taught that men were spiritually uh, inferior. And, and that's what uh, Paul is dealing with uh, in some of his epistles, which we don't have time to go in here. But I'll just tell you the same things going on today with the attitudes around feminism. And, and the notion that women are somehow superior now and men are looked down on. And, and, this, and that's what uh, Paul is saying, I would, that men pray everywhere. They have the ability to pray. Lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. You don't have to wonder whether or not your relationship with God gives you spiritual authority. You do have spiritual authority. So those same type of complexities were at work in, in, in Timothy, where he was ministering, where Titus was ministering, and where the church was called, where Paul planted the church in Corinth. And so you got to pull them out of, of that thinking and give them the biblical ideals. And that's the same thing that's going on in our culture today. Now, uh, uh, I, I just think the book of Corinthians, like Brother Gallium, when he uh, first took the church there in Eagle River, one of the first things he did was a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of 1 Corinthians. Why? Because it handles a ton of cultural issues. And you as a pastor don't look like you're just up there taking a shot at somebody on a Wednesday night Bible study. Now, that's incredibly wise uh, because... What it does is it gives you the ability to treat sensitive topics in a powerful way, in a biblical way. So I'll just challenge you students to understand that First, uh, first and Second Corinthians <clears throat> is a powerful way for you to understand how to preach from the Bible to complex, compromised, very pagan culture, which is now the American culture. We're not a, a Christian culture anymore, by and large. Uh, we're dealing with these same type of uh, complexities. All right, so now you get the context how powerful Corinthians is and how protective it is and dealing with the liberalism in the culture, like I've said, and also the liberalism trying to creep into the apostolic movement. Now, what I want to do is I want to lay some foundation down. Here are some bad claims that people make about these, this passage of Scripture. Uh, people will say, well, it's, number one, it's nothing more than an old cultural argument. Okay, now I'm going to call that a lie, number one. Well, it's just about an old cultural argument. All right, now this is what you need to say to somebody, all right? Uh, number one, culture, the word culture, is never used in 1 Corinthians 11, not once. Does it speak to all cultures? Yes. Uh, God's word and his desire about creative order and male and female speaks to all cultures and all time, even Corinthian cultures, by the way, even American culture and all the other cultures around the world. All right, so it's not just addressing Corinth. It's about God's creative order for all times and all places. How do you know? Well, the word culture is never used. So you cannot say it's just an old cultural argument. Another objection, I'll call this lie number two, or heresy number two, 
is Paul's only talking about a physical cloth. Now we're going to deal with that. The word for cloth, uh, parable A, is not used until verse 15. Okay? And, and the word parabolon or parable A, how it's phrased in the Greek as uh, the endings are, well, I was just here to get into that, but depending on how it's used in the, in the Greek. The word for veil is not used to verse 14, for, uh, 15. And then Paul says, her hair is her veil or her covering. So there's no way to make this about a physical veil. By the way, and I know it's behind, forgive me that it's behind the picture a little bit, Jewish men wore veils. They wore veils in the Bible. And so you just have to say, uh, this prayer shawl, uh, you know, would, is not forbidden for men to wear because they wore them in the Bible. It's about when to, you ready? Uh, people say, well, it's about, uh, women wearing cloth veils. Well, Paul says it's a shame for a man to wear it. It can't be about that because we're going to see that men wear the, wore those in the Bible. They would wear prayer uh, shawls when they would go. They still do that in Israel today. So uh, it is not a, about when to wear cloth veils. It's instead about God's creative uh, order. And, and, and you ready? How do you know? Because her hair is her veil. And and men are not commanded to wear this type of veil. Her, her hair uh, uh, uncut hair. He's commanded not to have that long hair, uncut hair. Uh, she is. And we're going to talk about that in detail. All right. So the objections, like it was just culture. Again, you have to say wearing a veil. They would say, well, wearing a veil was cultural. Uh, it was a, Cor a Corinthian thing. Uh, so we don't have to worry about it today. We no longer have to do it. And what you're going to see again, culture and cloth is never used. Covering is uh, but th then Paul says, her hair is her covering. And you get, you ready? What you have to say is, I'm going to let the Bible interpret covering. I'm not going to try to come up with it. You shouldn't try to come up with it. They shouldn't try to come up with it. The question is, what does the Bible say her covering is? And that's what we need to embrace as Christians. All right, so verse number two, Paul says it this way. Now, I praise you. Brethren, that ye remember all, me in all things. You remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I have delivered them unto you. All right, now, and now what Paul's going to say is, okay, I'm, I'm praising you, but you got some new converts. Uh, there's some that's been only in church a couple years and they don't know, so I'm going to give you uh, these things. And the present tense is there in the Greek. It's present active, and, and he says, I'm praising you right now, that, that wonderful a little thing right there, I praise you, is present tense. He says, I'm praising you right now. That's the tense of the Greek. Hati, because, now, we're gonna, I'm gonna, now this is going to have a little language in it, so just praise yourself, brace yourself. Uh, I praise you because, uh, or that, uh, you remember me, uh, in, 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 and why am I praising you? Because you've been following, and he's going to say, I, I want you now, You I brought you, You've been brought out of Corinth. I, I used to pastor you there. Now, uh, and Apollos came after me, and now you're in your third tier of leadership. He says, you've, you've been brought out of Corinth, so keep listening. I, I, you, I, I preach to you. You're out of the Corinthian culture now, so keep listening. And he says, Why, you're, you're keeping. I'm praising you right now because you're keeping and you're holding fast the ordinances. Now, what are the ordinances? That, that, that word is used, the Greek word is a paradosis, and, and you ready? It's the handed down commands or orders. It's used of the military, uh, the military. It's a military term used uh, in that day. And so Paul's saying, you ready? It's not an option, it's a command. I'm giving you what I've been commanded. You ready? If you got a problem with this, you got a problem with the commander in chief, God gave it to me. This is his creative order. I'm just giving you what I've been given. Paul is saying, if you're going to argue about this, you're not arguing with me. You're arguing with the commander in chief. I can only give you what I've been given. So this ordinances is a way to say the prescribed apostolic teaching. He says, even as I pass them on to you, God has a command of what he wants from a man and what he wants from a woman. He said, I just handed this to you. Okay? He said, it says in verse 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. 
Now, what does that mean? This is, again, about creative order. He says, um, the, uh, the, the head, kephale, or source, or, or spiritual authority, uh, flows this way. The origin of source of all that we should do, the head of every man is Christ. And the head of the woman is the man. And again, that's about submission and authority. So Christ is our example. Christ the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now why mention that? Because if Christ the man had to submit, you ready? Christ in a body submitted to, to the order of God, why in the world wouldn't you submit? And of course that's, that's what he's saying. All right now he says, the perfect man Jesus followed, you need to follow. It means uh, when you, when you uh, honor your head, which he's going to talk about that, or dishonor your head, he's going to say you dishonor uh, that, that person um, um, that, you're, uh, that is above you. And we dishonor Christ, Christ and by that God. Now, there are, there are non-apostolics. Now, here's what I want to do. I want to point this out. Uh, there are non-apostolics that agree that this is not merely about God's uh, a cultural issue, the cult, some cultural Corinthian thing. It's about crea creative order. Now, what is it? Now, R.C. Sproul is a uh, is a, a pastor. He ran Ligonier Ministry and Ligonier Seminary, and um, he's a, a well known theologian. Uh, has been respected by uh, very very strong Reformed teachers for many many years. Uh, so he's a, a heavy hitter, very respected in conservative circles. This is what he says. The thing that is most astonishing here is that he, Paul, is who he's talking about, appeals to, now notice what he says, not culture. He, he appeals to creation, not Corinth. If anything, he says, transcends local custom, it is those things that are rooted and ordered in creation. He says, that's why I'm very frightened to be loose with this passage. Now, that's where you have to tell some apostolics, it's not cultural. How do you know? Because he appeals to creation. Now, I'm not just saying, look, R.C. Sproul's on my side. There's two against one. I'm saying that R.C. Sproul's arguments are, are solid and right. He says he doesn't say culture once. He doesn't appeal to uh, Corinth. He appeals to creation, the creative order, right? About how God made male and female. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul appealed to first the creative order. He says, secondly, nature's witness. And then, uh, ready? Third, to angels. Okay? And then and he says, all which transcend culture. He says he appeals to, to culture, nature's witness, and then the angels, you ready? That has nothing to do with culture. He tells us, he says further, that the head covering is a part of the official apostolic teaching. You ready? And then number five, the practice of all the uh, churches of that day everywhere. Now there is the correct arguments. All of these things transcend culture. He gives us five things that transcend culture. And so you have to tell some apostolic that's wanting to backslide and walk away from this issue of separation and holiness and say, listen, uh, you just have to understand that there are even non-apostolics agree that this is not about culture. Here's five things that prove that it's not about culture. He says, so that means a local situation in Corinth cannot, now catch that, cannot explain head covering since it was the standard practice outside of Corinth. Of course, he means in the other churches as well. All the churches practice this even outside of the Corinth. Okay? And he says, if Paul merely told women in Corinth to cover their heads and gave no rationale for, for such instruction, we would be strongly inclined to supply it via our cultural knowledge. If, if Paul didn't say it's about creative order, it's about uh, uh, the nature, it's about, and he talks about even angels follow their creative order. And, and, and you're ready, it's a practice of all the churches everywhere and, and, and all of those wonderful things that he lists. He said, if, 
if those five things weren't there, yeah, you could argue that. But you can't argue that anymore. Why? Because he gives us these five things that all transcend culture. So don't make it about a, a local cultural context. In this case, however, Paul provides a rationale which is based on appeal to creation, not to the custom of some Corinthian harlots. So there are apostolics that say they had to wear a veil because you had these pagan women, and if you walked around with your head uncovered uh, in the culture, it looked like you were a prostitute. No, that's not the case. And R.C. Sproul says that's not even what Paul says in the text. He never uses Corinth uh, culture once. And by the way, we're going to learn that women were required to use wear veils uh, uh, or they would be seen as bad. But that wasn't during Paul's time. That came later under Catholicism. So it had nothing to do with first century women in Corinth. And we know that. And all the archaeology, by the way, is on our side of that issue. We'll, we'll show you how that works. Uh, 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 Sproul goes on to say, he goes on to say, we must be careful not to let our zeal for knowledge of the culture obscure what is actually said. What he's saying is what's actually said in the Bible. Acknowledge what the Bible says uh, on this issue. Uh, uh, so uh, he says uh, earlier in Paul's letter, when he had a command that was due to the situation at the time, he mentioned it. So earlier in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, um, he says that it's, you know, if you're not married, don't be married right now. But he qualifies it by saying, under this present distress, because persecution was ratcheting up. And he's saying, uh, I'm not forbidding to marry. And as a matter of fact, he said in the pastorals, uh, there's some her her heresy coming along, forbidding to marry, forbidding ministers, forbidding people to marry. He says that in all due respect uh, to the Catholic Church, that's a heresy. And, and, and so he says, he recommended not to marry in view of this present distress. So he says if Paul was to say this is a cultural issue, he qualifies it in the text. And, and by the way, the Lord has so watched over his word that you can't even reduce this to a cultural issue. Why? Because there was a cultural issue, and it's clearly named, and we can see that, that when Paul says it's a cultural issue, it's named clearly in the Bible. So Paul says... Or, or Sproul says, Paul could have done the same with head coverings, but he didn't. Because what was happening at the time wasn't the reason for the command. It wasn't a cultural issue. Additionally, the fact that he commands men to remove their coverings, 1 Corinthians 11.4, in the same sentence, cannot be explained by a situation that only deals with women. Now catch that. What he's saying is, if this was about women having to wear it to look godly, well, nobody argues that the Corinthians thought that men had to not wear their, their prayer shawls to look masculine or something. It has to do with physical hair. And there's no way uh, to deal with that uh, any other way, uh, all due respect. And you can get this out of R.C. Sproul's book called Knowing God, uh, he, he did this in 1977, chapter 5 on verse 110. Massive admissions from a Reformed scholar uh, that uh, admits that what apostolics have been teaching for years is in fact the biblical position. By the way, um, <clears throat> it means that Paul was right too. <laughs> Somebody got Paul right. All right, so, uh, well, there's so, some people object saying, well, no, there's not, but, but, well, they're just wrong in all due respect, uh, like R.C. Sproul. There's not one single early church writer who wrote that 1 Corinthians 11 taught that this was strictly uncut hair. As a matter of fact, we have an apostolic guy, one of our guys, unfortunately, that says this language is so obscure, there's no way, there, I mean, the early church fathers, right, none of those writers were clear, so we just lost that language. We don't even know how to interpret it today. And unfortunately, that good man needs to edit his book uh, and get caught up with uh, what what's, uh, current research have shown. So what I would say is, well, that's interesting. Let's see if that's true. There are many examples. I'll just list four. So uh, number one, the early church passed a law in 390 AD where the emperor, of course the Christian emperor, emperor by that time, decreed <clears throat> women who shall have shorn hair, cut hair, shorn means cut, 
contrary to divine and human laws. So he says, uh, not only is it wrong according to human laws, it's according to divine laws. Should be barred from the doors of a church. Now that's in Salzburg, um, uh, 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 Confessions uh, 105, and you can get that uh, at, the, at the Synod of Gangra. All right, and so you ready? There it is. It's wrong according to divine and human laws. And guess what? Whoops, you're wrong. Not one sing single early church writer. Well, that's wrong. All right, let's go a little further. Uh, the example number two, the early church's interpretation of Paul's use of kome and komao, cut and uncut, is remarkably uniform. In no case are these words taken to refer to the hair that is long and yet cut. Maybe I can just trim the ends and leave it long. And again, uh, you ready? That's not the case. How do you know? Uh, well, that uh, we're, we're going to see uh, another example. The consistent understanding that Brown brings, A. Philip Brown, we'll look at this in detail, is uh, uh, that, that emerges from all records. It's men are not to have uncut hair and women are to have uncut hair. Now, there are examples, the Senate of, of, of uh, uh, Gangra, a uh, Severin of uh, uh, Gabala, Augustine, uh, who wrote, uh, many theolo uh, theologians know who Augustine is, uh, in his work uh, of the work of monks and uh, Epiphanius uh, of Salamis, all of them said, you ready, the same thing, uh, that it means uh, uncut hair. And to have shorn hair is wrong and unlawful. And what? And so there you have four examples plus kind of this uniform thing that we're going to look uh, later uh, in history. All right, so uh, uh, let me give you some of those. All right, so examples include, here they are, one, two, three, four. Not one ch early church father, huh? Now, and you just have to say that's wrong. There they are. There's the examples. You just, and, and see, somebody can make an argument. Not one theologian says this. That's an argument from silence. And by the way, an argument from silence is, a, is the weakest kind of argument that you can give. And, and, and you ready? It's, it's, it's actually proven absolute. Not only is it weak, it's wrong. How do you know, Brother Kilman? Well, uh, again, here's the examples. And that's just four that we could name of many. And, and, and you ready? And, and this is not, again, about Jewish people wearing the talith or veils. And we've already said that because, it, again, uh, it's, it's the order of creation, the, the image and reflection of God in nature. It's about angels and, and again, uh, nature itself. So we've already talked about that. I won't visit that in detail. Verse 4, Paul says, Every man, therefore, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. Now, that his physical head, yes, but his head, more importantly, uh, Christ, and then by virtue of that, God. All right? How does he dishonor his head? Praying, having his head covered. Now, listen, you have to understand, Paul would have never went into synagogue and offended the Jewish people like if you go visit a synagogue today, they're going to give you a, a skull cap, a yarmulke. He would never have dreamed of going into a synagogue and praying or, or the temple and praying without having his head covered. He would never have done that. So this cannot be about physical veils. Okay? Uh, so, I mean, it's just clear. Literally, uh, the, the Greek is his head covering, kata kafales, and, and if you linger down, kata is down, Kephales, it's literally having down from the head. Now, what do you have down from your head if it's not a veil? It clearly cannot be a veil. There's only one thing that can hang down from my head. It's long hair. And see verse 14, and you can see it. For centuries, Jewish men wore prayer shawls. So the Bible is saying, Paul's saying, a man is not to have long, uncut hair as a hair covering. You ready? And a woman is to have long, uncut hair. And they were like, well, Brother Kilman, if it's if it's a woman is supposed to have uncut and she can, if it trim it is the same as cutting, cutting it, a man trimming it is the same as having uncut hair. No, no, no. It has to be between, between shorn and shaven. Right? My head is, is a, a cut with that number one and it's pretty close to shaven, right? So somewhere between shorn and shaven, it has to look somewhere between those two things. Okay, it's got to have a, 
Uh, as a matter of fact, we can see even in, in history, and we've already looked at that, at, the, at Lachish, uh, uh, the battle of Lachish, when they're being carried off into captivity, Jewish men had short hair. They had like uh, short hair. Why? Because that was the biblical prescription way back then. They would pull their hair in the Old Testament, and they had short hair because that's God's prescription for men. Pulling in the Old Testament is the same as having, and again, it wasn't like uh, trimming just the edges. No. Um, uh, it's somewhere between shorn and shaven. Okay? And, and we'll talk about that when we get to that text a little later in the passage. I know I'm pressing the envelope, but let me just finish this verse and then we'll uh, continue on uh, next time. All right, so a bower is a standard dictionary of Greek, uh, of the Greek language, <coughs> a lexicon. And he says, when you look at the word, a dishonoreth, a karesune, uh, is disgraces or puts to shame. And it's not like uh, shame, shame, oh, terrible, bad. It's disgraces. It's disgraceful for a man to have long hair. And it's used 13 times in the New Testament. And, and it's no shame for a man to wear a prayer covering or a veil or a cap. Covered means uncut hair, not the lack of a veil. How do you know? Because, because it corresponds to uncovered uh, in the text. So dishonoreth. His head uh, corresponds to uh, uncovered, akatakaluto uh, in, in the Greek. Now, what you have to know is Jewish men did, in fact, wear veils. So the fact that they would walk, you ready, uh, that, that, they, that they would have that covering, even the NIV, and there you can see, forgive me, it's behind the picture right now, but see the NIV footnote, a man, it says, the footnote says, a man with long hair. Now, why quote the NIV, Brother Kilman? Because even a more liberal translation, not a literal translation, that's more liberal. Um, they, even the NIV admits that we're right. A man should not have long hair. Okay, and that's just a straightforward interpretation of that text. Uh, and, and when you look at vines, um, and maybe some of you have it, vines or Bollinger, when you look at katakaluto, uh, the word for uh, uh, covered, and, and you look up the word veil in that dictionary, if you're looking, uh, if you look up, looking for veil, all the Greek words that mean veil, and you get the dictionary out and you go, how many ways, at, how many times can we find a veil? And you ready? Both in Vines and Bullinger, uh, uh, neither one of them. You cannot find Katakaluto as veil in either one of these. Why? Because they know that's not what this word is talking about. It's talking about hair. So it's not a veil. And even these two Greek experts, these two Greek dictionary, an expository and dictionary of New Testament words, they're going to look at all the words that mean veil. This word is not there. You ready? A Critical Lexicon and Concordance by Bollinger on page 80, 845. You can go look it up yourself and see if I'm telling a lie. I'm not. Neither one of them say Katakalupto is a veil. Why? Because it's hair. All right? And you just have to take that seriously. All right? And we'll, be, we'll start here next time because I know I'm running a little long on time. And uh, we'll start on verse 5 and move rather quickly. But I wanted to give you the big ideas first. That uh, you ready? The cultural crazies, the craziness in the culture. This separation matters between male and female, and and there are even some uh, great moment of of cultural admissions where theologians from other uh, denominations like R. C. Sproul, and we're going to look at others. A. Phillips Brown, a, a professor of New Testament at uh, Ohio Christian College, they're admitting they're right, that we're right, and it's no time for a good apostolic to be writing that we don't know what these words mean. When our stands are being affirmed as being right, not only right, being absolutely right in all of history. And uh, take that seriously and, and just know that you're living in a great moment where there are people that acknowledge uh, the things that you're going to have to teach have been right. And you're living in maybe even a better time than when I grew up as a young man teaching these types of things. So uh, you're living in a blessed moment. Understand God has given you favor and opportunity and uh, it's a wonderful blessing.